Welcome to the 2013 Bechtel Lectures. I'm Jim Pencratch, Dean of Conrad Grable University College. I'm glad to welcome you on behalf of President Susan schultz huxman and the college faculty. These Bechtel Lectures, as many of you know, are very significant events in the life of this college and in this community. Many of you have attended many of these public lectures and other events at Grable, and you know that public education community and community uh, education, community engagement, these are all important parts of our mission. The interaction with you as a community has enriched this college immensely. Each year we explore characteristics, contributions, and challenges of the Anabaptist Mennonite tradition and community. We offer new research, and we offer fresh interpretations. We've been fortunate over the years to bring excellent speakers and artists to enrich the life of the college and this community. And tonight, we continue that tradition of relevance, creativity, and excellence. We're glad you're here. Lester Bechtel has helped to establish these lectures and has sponsored them since they were inaugurated 13 years ago. He and his late wife, Dorothy, who was also chair of the Grable Board for a number of years, were strong supporters of the college far-sighted in their vision and hope for these lectures. They wanted to help Grable interpret and communicate the Anabaptist story to the public, to build bridges of understanding between the academy and the church. As you know, that's part of our mission. We thank Lester for helping us to fulfill our mission. We're sorry that he can't be with us tonight. He's not feeling well, and so he may be watching us on the video feed but he's not able to be with us, and he sends his regrets. He enjoys being here early on these evenings and meeting you as you come, and many of you know that you've met him and shaken his hand, and he's welcomed you here. In the eight years since I've been at Grable, I've been amazed what I've learned through these lectures. Let me just give you two examples. I had no idea that Dutch Mennonites were so involved with natural science in the 18th century until Dr. Ernest Ham of York University described that to us in 2010. Who would know? Well, you found out here if you were here. And then I was captivated by the novelist Sandra Birdsill in 2007 when she titled her lectures The Confessions of a Reluctant Mennonite. Oh, aren't we all? <laughs> I wondered about the difference between a reluctant Mennonite confessing or reluctant confessions of a Mennonite. But her lectures were intriguing as she explored writing from the outside and from the inside. And again, many of you will have read her work and were here at those lectures. Tonight, I'm sure you're also going to be stimulated by a deep and fresh look at a very familiar story. I want to remind you that these lectures have audiences beyond this room. Tonight, we are again live streaming this lecture through our Grable website. And to those of you who are with us through that medium, we welcome you as well, wherever you are. This will also be on our website for several weeks, so you can watch it again and recommend it to friends. Each of the Bechtel Lectures is also available. It's published in the Conrad Grable Review, the, scholar, the scholarly journal of this college. It's a way of communicating to a larger global audience. You can read the journal on our website. You can come to our library and pick it up and read it. You can subscribe to the journal, and of all things, we still arrange to have it delivered to your mailbox. After this lecture, we're going to have opportunity for some discussion and interaction, and we welcome you to have questions for us at the time. Now an introduction to Chris Marshall, who's our guest this year, and who will speak to us this evening. He comes to us from Wellington, New Zealand, from Victoria University, where he's in the Religious Studies faculty. Teaching, New Testament, theology, ethics, peace theology and practice, restorative justice, both in theory and in practice. He's also an expert in contemporary Anabaptist theology. And he's working on several projects related to all of these themes, restorative justice, religious violence, and biblical theology. While he was completing his doctoral studies in London, England, he and his wife became involved in the London Mennonite Center, a dynamic community of faith and fellowship for them during those four years, I believe that it was,
us that they were part of that community. In the years since then, Chris has expanded his friendships with many Anabaptists. He's become a global leader among Anabaptists in biblical studies, theology, ethics, and especially in recent years in restorative ethics, uh, restorative justice, maybe restorative ethics as well. He has deepened and enriched the tradition in which he has found a home. Now, much of what he will bring us in these lectures and what he brought us last night and will bring us tonight is explored in full in this recent book, Compassionate Justice, an interdisciplinary dialogue with two gospel parables on law, crime, and restorative justice. We're pleased we've been able to get copies of this book directly from the publisher at a special price. You'll find them at the book table in the reception area. They're hardly available in Canada yet, so we're very, very pleased we were able to do that for you. Now, this recent book builds on themes that he has written about often during the past 15 years. For example, the title of some of those books, The Little Book of Biblical Justice, A Fresh Approach to the Bible's Teaching on Justice. Crowned with Glory and Honor, Human Rights in the Biblical Tradition. And Beyond Retribution, A New Testament Vision for Justice, Crime, and Punishment. He's been given honors for many of his publications. He's won awards for teaching and for his involvement in community justice. Last evening, Chris carefully and thoughtfully probed the gospel story of the encounter between a lawyer and Jesus that resulted in the story that we often refer to as the Good Samaritan. But after hearing Chris last night, I think we could probably call it the story of our Samaritan neighbor. Tonight we'll return to that story to learn more about restorative justice, compassion, the love of God, and love of neighbor. Chris, we're very grateful for your visit, for what you've already offered us in your lecture and in many conversations. We welcome you as you present this second next lecture for 2013 on the topic compassion, justice, and the work of restoration. Please welcome Chris Marshall. April the 4th, 1967, the great American civil rights leader, the Reverend, Ma the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., delivered a speech to a gathering of an organization called Clergy and Laity Concerned About Vietnam at the wonderfully majestic Riverside Church in New York City. Professing his wholehearted agreement with the aims and the work of the organization, King recounted how, over the preceding two years, he had moved, in his own words, to break the betrayal of my own silences about the war. Many had questioned the wisdom of him doing so, he said, fearing it would detract from his focus on civil rights. But coming out against the war, King retorted, was not only consistent with the ongoing commission to peacemaking implicit in the Nobel Peace Prize, 
that he had received in 1964, it was also consistent, he said, with his commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. To me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious that I sometimes marvel at those who ask me why I am speaking against the war. King proceeded to deplore the dishonorableness of America's intentions in Vietnam and to detail the enormous suffering the three decades of war had inflicted on the people of that blighted peninsula. He called for an end to aerial bombardment, the declaration of a unilateral ceasefire, the opening of negotiations with the Viet Cong, and the setting of a firm date for the withdrawal of all foreign troops from the country. He also proposed that all young men in America should register as conscientious objectors, and he encouraged all ministers of religion to give up their ministerial exemptions from military service and also to enroll as conscientious objectors. But King went further still. True to his trade as a preacher and a public prophet, he asserted that the war in Vietnam was but a symptom of a far deeper malady in the American spirit. If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, he said, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. A nation that is prepared to send its poor Negro and white boys to kill and die together in the villages of Southeast Asia, but is unable to seat them together in the same schools or to house them in the same city blocks, is a nation in spiritual decline. A country that chooses to invest its vast wealth and resources in the demonic destructiveness of militarism, rather than in rehabilitating the poor, is, he said, a society gone mad on war. What America needed, King declared, is a radical revolution of values, entailing a shift from being a thing-oriented society to becoming a person-oriented society, and accompanied by a reordering of priorities so that the pursuit of peace takes precedence over the pursuit of war. Without such a moral and spiritual revolution, America will never be able to conquer the giant triplets of racism, materialism, and militarism. King continued with these memorable words. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside. But that will only be an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It is not haphazard and superficial. It comes to see that an edifice that produces beggars needs restructuring. A true revolution of values will look uneasily at the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth and say, this is not just. A true revolution of values will say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This burning, this business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of people normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of spiritual uplift is approaching spiritual death. The Vietnam War is over, and many things have changed in American society since. But Dr. King's searing critique of American militarism and its inextricable relationship between racism, with racism and social injustice, remains as pertinent today as it did 40 years ago.
read Afghanistan in place of Vietnam, and his speech could well have been delivered just last week. The speech is also, I think, an instructive example of a particular way of approaching Christian social engagement. The speech is fundamentally an anti-war homily. It's not an analysis of domestic, social, and political policy. But King refuses to compartmentalize the nature of justice. And he moves backwards and forwards between the tragedy of Vietnam and the violence and poverty of America's ghettos as two sides of the same coin. King explains that one of the things that impelled him to raise his voice against the war was the incongruity of commending nonviolent social change to the desperate, rejected, and angry young men on the streets of America's cities, while the American government modeled a way of resolving its problems overseas through employing masses, do, massive doses of violence, to use his words. So King's style of social commentary is one that exposes the interconnectedness of all spheres of collective life and insists on the need for consistency between what the state expects of its citizens and how the state itself acts. A second noteworthy feature of King's approach is that he does not begin with some speculative theory of justice or a precast list of ethical principles or a code of human rights that are then applied to social reality in order to determine an appropriate course of action. He doesn't begin with the theory and then apply it to reality. Instead, King begins with reality. He begins on the one hand with a personal confession of his own complicity in the problems he is describing. And on the other hand, with an account again grounded in vivid personal experience of concrete situations of poverty, violence, racism, and injustice, both at home and abroad. What justice requires, King assumes, cannot be discerned in the abstract from the safe distance of a policy analyst or an academic specialist. It can only be discovered by looking squarely at the actual embodied suffering of the victims of oppression and questioning the structural arrangements that perpetuate their suffering. A third feature of King's approach is his appeal to religious or spiritual resources to envision change. King speaks of his own commitment to Jesus Christ, and he emphasizes the universal brotherhood and indeed the divine sonship of all people under God's fatherhood. Along with quotes from President Kennedy, Arnold Toynbee, and several black poets, King quotes two biblical texts verbatim, and he alludes to a third the parable of the Good Samaritan. It is this third allusion that for me is the most interesting and has been the most frequently quoted by Christian social activists. King's memorable words make the point that while doing works of compassion is an important part of the Christian calling, by itself it is not enough. It must be accompanied by a transformation of the social structures that generate poverty and violence in the first place, by the repaving, as King puts it, of the Jericho Road. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that would only be an initial act. One day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. King's point that there is more to Christian mission than patching up the victims of structural injustice is absolutely correct. As well as being good Samaritans, 
we have to ask about why the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is so damn dangerous in the first place. But there is still a huge amount for us to learn about the nature of justice and the task of Christian social engagement by attending closely to the actions of the Good Samaritan himself. And that is what I want to do in the remainder of this lecture. If you wondered last night, how can somebody speak for an hour on one little story? Well, that was just the beginning. <laughs> and after tonight, there's still war, and for that you'll need to read the book. Or even better, buy the book. <laughs> of all the stories Jesus told, None has been absorbed more deeply into the moral and legal traditions of Western civilization than the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Now I'm sure the story doesn't need summarizing uh, to you. It's well known. It's a story of a man who was brutally assaulted on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho and left for dead on the side of the road. Two passing temple officials noticed the unconscious man in the ditch but instead of stopping to help them, they cross to the other side of the road and carry on their journey. Then a travelling Samaritan happens upon the victim. He's moved with compassion at what he sees. He bandages the man's wounds. He lifts him onto his donkey. He transports him to a nearby inn and takes care of him overnight. The following day, the Samaritan resumes his journey, but only after paying the innkeeper to carry on looking after the man until he has uh, recovered his full health. My first discovery when I began looking at this story was to realize that this parable has had the most immense impact on the development of Western culture. Its influence far exceeds the boundaries of strictly religious or theological discourse. The parable still figures frequently as a starting point for discussions in moral philosophy and social psychology about altruism and the nature of social responsibility, while in legal theory it continues to inform debates about the relationship between morality and law and about the scope of personal liability. It's also, perhaps better known, played an even greater role in medical ethics and in the shaping of the practice codes of several helping professions. It's frequently incited to encourage charitable pursuits in the local community and to support philanthropy on, a, on the global stage, especially in the form of emergency aid and relief assistance. In the political arena, Good Samaritanism, oops, I hit myself. Good Samaritanism <coughs> has been used to justify military interventions in other countries for humanitarian reasons or to uphold human rights or to remedy failed states. Most recently, it has figured in debates about immigration, the treatment of asylum seekers, and the obligations of hospitality towards displaced populations. To say it's figured in these debates is not to say that people have done to the parable what I do to it in the book, which is to look at it with a fine magnifying glass, go through the fine tooth comb, but to say that the concept of being a good Samaritan has been appealed to in all these areas. So the intellectual and the cultural legacy of the parable has been enormous. As one observer once remarked, the parable of the Good Samaritan has built hospitals all over the world. And if it were truly heated, it would end racism, eliminate national hatreds, and abolish war. Now, as Jim pointed out, I've just published a book that seeks to explore the implications of this parable and the parable of the prodigal son, which we were talking about at lunchtime today, for developing a Christian theory of restorative justice, which is a personal interest of mine, although it ranges even wider than just restorative justice and looks at its role in, in, in uh, legal practice more generally. But I'm particularly interested in restorative justice. That this parable has a particular pertinence to the theme of restorative justice. I mean, why go to this parable in particular and, uh, and wring every bit of life out of it that I can manage? Well, I think there are at least four 
clues in the story that I, I think justify uh, looking at this parable as a parable of restorative justice. The most obvious, of course, is that the story deals with an episode of criminal violence. And as we will see shortly, it affords quite remarkable insight into the experience of criminal victimization. It's a story about a crime, so that's enough, really, to draw it into the sphere of restorative justice reflection. Secondly, though, the story reflects extensively on the duty of care owed to victims of crime by other members of the community. More words are devoted to describing the actions of the Samaritan than those of the two temple officials combined. His compassionate deeds are spelled out, again as we'll see uh, shortly, his compassionate deeds are spelled out in extraordinary detail because each individual action helps to define what is entailed in restoring victims to wholeness and autonomy following the tragedy they have suffered. Third, and hugely significant for my purposes, is that the parable is told in response to a question from a lawyer about how to gain eternal life and about the scope of provisions in biblical law legislating care for one's neighbours. This is actually the only parable in the Gospels that is expressly used to explain or defend an item of legal interpretation. The entire narrative is in fact saturated with legal terminology, allusions, procedures, and assumptions, which the vast majority of commentators don't notice. And there is no time to lay these out in detail here, but they reinforce the relevance of the parable to questions of legal theory and practice. In fact, there's a, for New Testament scholars amongst us, there's a, a widespread view that Luke has very little interest uh, in the law. Uh, I think this parable suggests we need to rethink that, quest, that, that comment. The fourth way in which the parable bears on the concerns of criminal justice was discussed in last night's lecture. The fact that Jesus deliberately casts a hated national enemy, a Samaritan, as the one who upholds God's law and fulfills the love commandment, directly challenges our propensity to categorize people dualistically as friend or foe, citizen or foreigner, good or bad, guilty or innocent, even victim or offender. The parable subverts our tendency to divide the world simplistically into goodies and baddies and teaches that goodness may be found even amongst those who we most often regard as evil. Nowhere is this lesson more relevant today than in the sphere of crime and justice, where that dualistic division of people is deeply entrenched and widespread. So my contention is that the parable has much to say about crime, the rule of law, and restorative justice. In the time that remains, however, I want to focus on just two dimensions of the parable. The insight that it affords into the bitter experience of victimization, what it means experientially to be the victim of injustice and brutality and its remarkable depiction of what is required to restore victims to well-being. Now, in both respects, the parable is dealing primarily with criminal victimization and repair. But its insights, I think, are equally applicable to other kinds of victimization, such as being the victim of family violence, or social injustice, or racial discrimination, or political oppression, or countless other kinds of systemic evil. Research suggests that victims of human malice, in whatever form it takes, have many similar reactions and needs. And I'm sure, even if you don't have much interest in the criminal justice sphere, I'm sure you'll be able to transfer much of what the parable says to your own 
area of specialist uh, interest or community ministry. The story opens with a certain man. We talked about this in the question time last, last night. He's just described as a certain man. Setting out on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho, about 23 kilometers away. Nothing is said about this man's religious, ethnic, or social identity. He is simply a man. A person. The road he traveled was steep and treacherous, twisting through barren terrain honeycombed with caves and gullies that provided ample hiding places for the many robbers who infested the area. It was extremely dangerous territory to pass through and remained so for most of subsequent history. The journey would normally have taken about six hours to complete on foot. But on this occasion, the man's journey, the man's progress on his journey, is cut short by a violent attack. The Greek word used for his assailants, uh, they say, indicates that they are not merely opportunist thieves, but well-armed brigands or outlaws who preyed on vulnerable travellers in, in, in the countryside. Social banditry was a major problem at the time. Unemployed workers or peasants driven off their land through debt or famine or excessive taxation sometimes resorted to brigandage in order to survive. And their primary victims were the ruling elites whom they held as being responsible for their plight. Some commentators suggest that Jesus' first hearers would have felt immediate sympathy for these highwaymen who are mentioned in the parable, seeing them as sort of Robin Hood type figures who uh, struggled valiantly against social and political oppression, that their sympathies would have been with the, uh, the thieves. But this strikes me as very unlikely and somewhat fanciful. The penalty for brigandage was death. And the fear of being attacked by bandits was widespread in the populace. Besides, the parable scarcely portrays the robbers in a positive light. They are responsible for extreme violence against a nameless victim whose simple humanity is highlighted, while the social rank is left deliberately ambiguous. It is ambiguous because the only thing seized by his attackers is his clothing. In addition to beating him, they stripped him. In the ancient world, clothing was a consistent indicator of wealth and status. So it's possible that the stripping of the victim implies he was a wealthy man whose expensive clothing was worth stealing. On the other hand, it could indicate that he was so poor that the only thing he possessed were the rags on his back which the bandits took in spiteful frustration. We don't know how rich or poor, important or ordinary this character was. He is simply a human being. Whatever his social rank, the man is treated cruelly by his assailants and is left for dead. The dramatic description of his attack in just a few short phrases captures, I think, no fewer than five common aspects of the experience of criminal victimization or of any kind of victimization. And these, I think, are spelled out carefully at the beginning of the story because if the man is ever to be restored to well-being, every dimension needs to be addressed. First and most basically, his victimization was an occasion of profound disempowerment. He fell into the hands of robbers. Without warning, total strangers invade his life, disrupt his normal routine, seize control of his person, and reduce him to abject impotence. From this point on, the man is portrayed as completely passive, utterly dependent on the goodwill of others for his very survival. He is radically disempowered by his assailants. That is what being a victim is fundamentally about. An enforced, uninvited, crippling 
debilitating powerlessness. Secondly, his victimization was an experience of physical violation. They beat him, literally to within an inch of his life, leaving him half dead. The phrase used here for his beating is the same expression used for the ferocious flogging dished out to Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail in Acts 16. The word half dead is exceedingly rare in Biblical Greek, though there is a striking parallel in a later papyrus document where a woman lays a complaint about an episode of domestic violence in which her brother and sister-in-law, quote, nearly killed me by the number of blows and left me half dead. Clearly then, the traveller in the parable is subjected to severe violence. His bodily integrity is brutally violated by his attackers, and he's discarded like a worthless piece of garbage. Later, his rescuer must bandage his oozing wounds before he attempts to move him to safety. Thirdly, his victimization was an experience of psychological humiliation. They stripped him. Clothing in the ancient world was an essential means of signaling one's wealth, one's class, or one's religious role. And the ability to recognize one's peers by their appearance, by their clothing, was enormously important. Wearing ornate clothing was a sign of personal dignity and honor and status, whilst being stripped of clothing was a sign of humiliation and degradation. It's what happened to Jesus uh, in the Passion <coughs> story. And this is what happens to the victim. In being stripped nude and left exposed on the roadside, he is profoundly humiliated. He is not only robbed of personal dignity by this act, he is also deprived of his social belonging. For with his stolen clothing, when all available markers of his ethnic identity and his social location. He's naked and unconscious and therefore unable to speak, and therefore all external clues as to his individual or cultural or religious identity are taken away. He is reduced to an absolute minimum, an exposed, anonymous, insensible human being whose only claim on anyone else's attention is his misery. Fourth, the victim's experience is one of social isolation. They went away, leaving him. He's left alone in a lonely place to die a lonely, lingering, solitary death. So isolated is he that we're told in verse 31 it's only by chance that is battered and bruised body is seen by anyone at all. Even then, the first people who come across him, he let to leave him in his abandoned state. He is twice forsaken. First by his attackers, then by his potential rescuers, whose indifference to his plight is a cruelty of equal magnitude. Victims of severe violence often speak of the disconnection they feel from those around them even from close friends and acquaintances who are unable or perhaps unwilling to fathom their pain, to bridge the gap to their desolate condition. The aloneness they experienced in being singled out by their assailant for harming and hurting is continued in a profound sense of aloneness in struggling with its aftermath. This sense of abandonment or God forsakenness, if you like, is perhaps the profoundest form of grief. <coughs> I once heard a judge in New Zealand speak of her experience of chairing a listening panel that had been set up by the government to provide an opportunity for victims of child abuse in state care to speak of their experience. So a panel of very um, senior and important people, judges and the like, was, was convened to travel the country and to hold hearings where people who had been in foster care or had been in orphanages uh, 
or in some, some other form of state here that suffered abuse could come and tell their stories. And the panel was simply there to listen, it had no authority to award reparation or to uh, pursue any kind of action against their abusers. It was simply conferring the dignity of important people listening to uh, sometimes elderly people speak of events that happened when they were small children. And the judge who chaired the panel said that the sort of uh, enduring sense she has when she listens to all these stories of people suffering, the most sort of powerful memory that she had of all these stories was this sense of abandonment the sense of the victims felt of being utterly alone, totally abandoned. It's the profoundest form of victimization, I think, to feel utterly alone. Finally, the victim's experience is one of enduring vulnerability. They left him half dead. The suffering began at the time of the criminal assault but his torment is not yet over. For the remainder of the story, and I think this is important, the victim hovers between life and death. Those who stumble upon him on the road have a choice. They can either, like the priest and the Levite, regard him as good as dead already, beyond any worthwhile effort to restore, or, like the merciful Samaritan, they can defy the logic of death and against all odds, seek to fan the flicker of life back into flame. There's no middle way. Those who encounter victims can either surrender to the logic of destruction unleashed by the wrong and reckon their powerless, violated, humiliated and abandoned state to be hopeless, or they can strive to bring hope and healing to the victim, however remote they may seem at the time. The first option is starkly illustrated by the actions of the priest and the Levite. The second option is shown by the actions of the Samaritan. Last night I suggested that Jesus' first audience would have been taken aback at the appearance of a Samaritan in the story. They would have likely expected the third character, because stories always have three characters, in them, three little pigs, three bears. Just standard folk tradition to have three. They would expect that the third character to be an Israelite layman. Because the threefold division of priests, Levites, and all the children of Israel was a standard way of describing the religious diversity of the nation. Yet not only does Jesus use a Samaritan in place of an Israelite, he portrays him as responding in a way that puts the Jewish characters to shame. The unlikely character of the Samaritan becomes the very embodiment of divine compassion towards the anonymous stranger lying motionless in the ditch. The Samaritan's actions towards the victim are recounted in quite exquisite detail because I suggest they serve to exemplify exactly what is entailed in loving one's neighbor as oneself. For Jesus, neighbor love is more than simple benevolence. It's more than showing respect for the equal rights of others. It is, rather, a love to be patterned after our love for God. Just as we are called to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, so we are called to show the same all-encompassing love for others. This is, as I explained last night, the most staggering feature of this parable and its most disturbing challenge. The Samaritan's display of love is unreserved in its passion and commitment. It exceeds mere charity because it engages all the powers of his personality, his sight, his heart, his hands, his strength, his time, his possessions, and his intelligence. First to be engaged are his eyes. Like the priest and the Levite, he saw the victim. But unlike them, he saw him up close. He drew near to his actual person. Whereas the priest came down that road, and the Levite came to the place, the Samaritan, we are told, drew near to him. 
Whereas the other travelers looked at the victim superficially, the Samaritan entered fully into his personal space. The three travelers all had the same physical evidence to go by. For all of them, the naked, motionless body was without visible signs of ethnicity or social status, and for all intents and purposes appeared to be dead. The priest and the Levite used such equivocal evidence as an excuse to do nothing. The Samaritan saw a suffering human being and got involved in rescuing him. Sometimes said that the most important question in ethics is not what should I do, but what do I see? Or how do I see? How do I look at things? And what we are uh, to do in terms of actions flows from, from the way we see things. The Samaritan saw him, saw a real human being. And for that reason, the next thing to be engaged was his heart or his feelings. He was moved with compassion. This is the crucial turning point in the story. The reference to compassion actually comes halfway through the narrative almost exactly. Perhaps one calculation says exactly same number of syllables before and after the reference to compassion. It comes exactly halfway through the narrative and it shatters the parallelism between the three characters. All three see the victim, but only the Samaritan is overcome with compassion. The verb used here denotes a gut-wrenching surge of emotion in the innards. In Luke's Gospel, compassion is supremely a divine attribute something that belongs to God. Just as God has compassion on Israel and comes to her rescue in sending the Messiah in Luke chapter 1, just as Jesus has compassion when he sees the widow of Nain burying her dead son and restores him to life in Luke chapter 7, just as the father of the prodigal son is filled with compassion when he sees his starving son stumbling up the road and rushes to embrace him in Luke chapter 15, so the Samaritan is overcome with compassion when he sees the condition of the battered victim. Compassion expresses a godlike and a God-given capacity to empathize with the suffering of others, to enter into their world and share emotionally in their pain while still regarding it as their pain and not your own. Compassion uh, shares in the suffering, but still acknowledges the otherness and the distinctiveness of the person. There's an important sense in which the Samaritan's heart overruled his head. The Samaritan could well have proceeded by way of logical calculation, first determining whether the victim was a fellow Samaritan, then choosing to show love to him. But there is no hint of any such reasoning. His, his, his instinctive response is one of compassion, not calculation. The casuistic strategy adopted by the priest and the Levite is simply not part of the Samaritan's moral universe. Of course, having one's heart in the right place is rarely enough in order to genuinely help someone in need. Compassion may inspire the decision to help, but some level of rational analysis is also required to ensure that any help provided will actually prove beneficial. Deciding how to help, in other words, is just as critical as deciding whether to help. And compassion might drive the, the desire to do something, but something more is needed to know what to do. In fact, even the decision whether to help is not the automatic product of compassionate feelings. An overpowering surge of emotion in a person may prove paralyzing in the observer. Or perhaps even more important to note, uh, to those of us who are Christian people especially, uh, sometimes the feeling of compassion serves as a kind of morally satisfying response to the problem. In other words, I feel I've done enough by feeling sorry about it. This shows that I'm a sensitive person, I'm a loving person, I'm a good person, because I feel so bad about what I see. And then you carry on, <laughs> on the other side of the road. 
So the feelings themselves are not enough by themselves. They need not, may not generate any tangible results. So there's more needed than compassion. But for the Samaritan, it didn't stay at the level of an emotional ups uh, overflow of feelings. Because the next thing to be activated in his case were his hands and feet. He went and bandaged his wounds. In other words, his interior experience of emotional compassion was translated into exterior deeds of deliverance. And it was his act of doing mercy, not his empathetic feelings, his act of doing mercy in verse 37 that fulfilled the commandment to love his neighbor as himself. His movement toward the victim counteracted the victim's isolation and rejection. His bandaging of his wounds counteracted his physical violation and started him on the road to healing. In dressing his wounds, the Samaritan would probably, well, the Samaritan would, does use his own possessions, and the bandages were probably torn from his clothing or headgear because he probably hadn't been to the pharmacy and bought remade bandages uh, beforehand. Bandages would have been taken from his own clothing. And the oil and the wine that he used would have likely come from his commercial cargo. He was probably a merchant who was a trader in oil and wine. Oil was a household remedy for pain relief, and wine was commonly used as a disinfectant. But oil and wine were not only used as medicinal remedies. They also played an important role in temple worship as sacrificial libations. You don't need to posit elaborate allegorical associations to recognize an additional layer of symbolic significance in the Samaritan's use of oil and wine to minister to the victim. In showing practical concern for the welfare of the victim, irrespective of religious considerations, the Samaritan offers true worship to God. The prophet Micah declares that what God requires more than 10,000 rivers of oil poured out in cult of worship is justice, mercy, and humility. The Samaritan enacts the truth of this message in contrast to the priest and the Levite. They would have often poured oil and wine on the temple altar in Jerusalem in expressions of profound devotion. But they failed to manifest their spiritual worship in merciful justice toward the crime victim. It is the hated Samaritan who offers the worship of justice and mercy in pouring oil and wine on the victim's wounds and not just on the religious altar. Next, the Samaritan enlists his power to change the victim's circumstances. He put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn. He picked the defenseless man up in his arms, heaved him onto his mount, and removed him to a place of greater security. The implication of putting him on his own animal, as Luke says, is that the Samaritan would have dismounted and gone ahead on foot, leading the animal by a tether, like a servant boy. In seeking to transform the victim's circumstances, the Samaritan displays striking humility as well as astonishing courage. Once at the inn, the Samaritan devotes time and attention to the victim's recovery, and he took care of him. The inn would have been a dirty and dangerous place. It was no luxury resort. It would have been a square enclosure, open to the skies, with rows of stalls for animals and straw on the ground for their owners to sleep on beside their beasts. But the Samaritan does not sleep. Instead, he tends the wounded man throughout the night. The victim is not abandoned a second time, but is sustained in a relationship of sheltering care. He is not left alone. At daybreak, the Samaritan must depart on business, but the victim is still not fit to travel. So the Samaritan took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. There are several remarkable details in this final scene of the story. One is the amount of money involved. It's estimated that two denarii would have covered room and board for several weeks, maybe for months. The Samaritan makes provision, in other words, for the long-term recuperation of the victim. 
He can't be there to nurse him in person, so he deputizes the innkeeper to serve as his agent, instructing him to continue rendering the same care that he had showed overnight to the victim once he leaves. It's the same verb in both cases. By accepting payment in advance, the innkeeper bound himself to carry out this commission. Again, this is perhaps the most extraordinary, but any more extraordinary is that, the most extraordinary detail of all. The Samaritan enters into this open-ended financial arrangement with the innkeeper, promising to cover any further expenses he might incur. The solemn promise, I will repay you, was a legal formula for taking over someone's debt. His concern was to afford the injured man protection from being imprisoned or enslaved for unpaid bills at the end of his stay. The Samaritan's chances of being defrauded were considerable, but he makes himself vulnerable to extortion in order to spare the victim the possibility of subsequent victimization. That the Samaritan exhibits such concern for the future experience of the victim attests to an important, though uncomfortable, truth for all engaged in community development work, such as, for example, that uh, done by MCC or by any other like agency. And the truth is this. Once aid is given to those in need, that act initiates a chain of events in which the provider remains morally implicated. It's well known, especially in humanitarian work, and indeed in restorative justice, a principle that I was taught, that every intervention has unintended consequences. Every intervention has unintended consequences. And even benevolently intended interventions may sometimes have a damaging impact on the beneficiary. Those who intervene, therefore, are obliged to anticipate, as best they can, the likely consequences of their involvement and to address any unforeseen negative effects that may flow from them. Good, good intentions are not sufficient. Moral foresight is also required because well-meaning gestures can easily go awry. The Samaritan in the parable anticipates the possibility that the victim may end up being indebted to the innkeeper and therefore remain unrestored to wholeness. So he assumes personal responsibility to mitigate this potentially destructive outcome. The Samaritan then not only draws the victim into a community of care, he ensures that this community will continue into the future as long as the victim has need of it. He also makes sure that the victim will emerge from this time of convalescence into a position of independence and freedom. Charity alone can enslave. True justice seeks to restore autonomy and self-reliance. All in all, some nine different actions are performed by the Samaritan. Nine. Such extraordinary detailing of his deeds, I suggest, is because they enact and illustrate in concrete terms what it really means to love one's neighbor as oneself. In essence, it means, again referring to last night, it means loving others in the same way that we love God. The two obligations cannot be separated. They constitute a single reality. Just as our love for God must embrace all the dimensions of our personality, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, so too must our love for others. The Samaritan was engaged emotionally, physically, materially, socially, financially, and morally in reaching out to the dying man on the roadside. He goes be well beyond what was minimi, minimally necessary to save his life, but shows a superlative dedication to his full restoration. His restoration to community is a re-empowerment and a liberation, as well as a healing and a recuperation. And for this reason, the Samaritan's response qualifies as an exemplary demonstration of restorative justice 
or perhaps we should say, especially here in Canada, transformative justice in all its fullness. Let me draw these threads together then. The parable was told to a lawyer who asked Jesus to pronounce on the necessary conditions for gaining or inheriting eternal life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replies by asking the lawyer about what the law says on the matter. The lawyer responds by nominating wholehearted love for God and love for neighbour as the law's most essential requirements. Jesus congratulates him on the right answer and tells him to do these commandments and then he will gain life. But the lawyer is a lawyer after all and so he asks Jesus for a definitive statement on exactly who is my neighbor. Clearly, if doing the law by loving one's neighbor is the critical requirement for entry to the new age, an unambiguous definition of the object of such love seems to be critically important. You could say eternally important. I gave a paper recently why, which I subtitled Why Loving One's Neighbor Matters in the Long Run, because it, it reaches out to issues of eternal life. Jesus responds to this question, who is my neighbor, with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Then he invites the lawyer to make his own interpretive judgment on the matter of neighborliness. Jesus was a very good teacher in this respect. How does it seem to you, he asks, which of the three was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? So like a good teacher, Jesus ends with a question. The question returns to the lawyer's original inquiry, but in a significantly modified form. It no longer focuses on the identity of the other as neighbor, but on the questioner's own identity as a neighbor. It is not who is my neighbor, but to whom am I a neighbor? There is a shift from object to subject, from recipient of compassion to agent of compassion. And with it, a decisive shift from the realm of legal abstraction and jurisprudential de definitions to the world of relational engagement. So which of the three men, the lawyer is asked, acted like a neighbor to the man in the ditch. Posed this way, only one answer is possible. For only one of the three characters did anything at all to benefit the victim. The one who showed him mercy, the lawyer replies. The lawyer, remember, had initially asked Jesus what he must do to win eternal life. And Jesus responded that he must do the law by now indicating that the Samaritan does mercy. The lawyer implies that the heretical outsider, the heretic, meets the requirement of doing the law and thus opens the door of eternal life to him. Jesus confirms this by issuing his second imperative to the lawyer. Go you and do likewise. The present tense of the verb do underscores the constant or habitual nature of the specified action. Mercy is not a singular one-off episode or a sequence of one-off episodes in one's dealings with others. It is a comprehensive way of life to which every individual is called. The message of the parable then, I suggest, is inescapable, and it is this. The continual practice of mercy is an essential individual requirement for entry to the age of salvation. The continual practice of mercy is an essential individual requirement for entry to the age of salvation. The Samaritan qualifies to enter. The priest 
and the Levite do not. In this way, as one commentator puts it, the parable, and I quote, exposes any religion with a mania for creeds and an anemia for deeds. An uptightness about orthodoxy not matched by a parallel concern for orthopraxy. Not just for believing the right things, but for doing the right things. It also exposes any approach to criminal justice that places a concern for legal technicalities and professional decorum ahead of the actual needs of victims and that diverts the wider social community from its overriding responsibility to work towards the restoration of victims to a place of health, strength, freedom and autonomy. Now nothing in the parable is said about the need to catch and punish the robbers, though the justice of doing so might be assumed. Nothing is said about what the kind-hearted Samaritan would have done had he arrived on the scene in the middle of the attack, though he might well have intervened in some hopefully non-violent way. <laughs> Nothing is said, of course, about the need to make the highway safer for travellers, or about the value of drafting more police into the region to determine to deter similar attacks in the future, though deterrence has its place and security is always worth considering, but not obsessing over as we do these days. We are called, sorry, I'm getting myself here. We are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, Martin Luther King observed. But one day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed. True compassion is more than flinging a coin at a beggar. It comes to see that a system that produces beggars needs to be repaid. King's words. And they're undoubtedly true words. But the parable does not address these larger systemic issues in detail, not because they're unimportant or inessential to consider in any comprehensive approach to crime or law or conflict resolution or social injustice. Not because they're unimportant, but because the overriding concern of this story is the duty of restoration towards the victim and the priority of the victim's needs in the interpretation and administration of the regime of law. One final comment promise it's the last one. The parable is not, in fact, totally silent about the need for systemic change. Uh, in my book, pages 133 to 137, <laughs> I suggest that the action of transporting the victim to the inn and enlisting the innkeeper in his future care involved a transformation of his environmental circumstances and in that sense intimates the need for structural change as well as for victim support. The same applies, as we saw last night, in the Samaritan's forging of a relationship with the Jewish victim, thereby ignoring and delegitimating de the prevailing structures of violence and exclusion towards enemies. We talked about how these sort of relationships between uh, first world enemies can actually completely subvert the, the systemic structures of violence and hatred. It's even possible to detect systemic implications in the absence of the narrative of any hint of counter-violence against the perpetrators of the crime, any suggestion that violence could serve the cause of justice. So the parable actually has perhaps more to say on systemic and political matters than is often thought. But even so, this is not its dominant focus. For the parable recognises, I think, that there is something far more difficult than achieving social or systemic change. Something far more difficult than social or political or systemic change. And that is becoming a truly loving person who engages all the powers of their personality on behalf of others. For that kind of love, 
We need more than political and social change, important though they be. We need the power of God. As Paul writes, if I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now faith, hope, and love remain. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. Thank you. coming across uh, someone needing help. The Good Samaritans did all this at probably was quite an expense. And as we go along as we today, we come across these things to try and do the same thing would, for most of us, seem almost impossible. So what is our answer uh, when we come across this kind of a situation? We need more. We need the help of governments. This is something that uh, a leader of years back, Tommy Douglas, you know, fostered. And we have a health care system. But our health care system is starting to erode. So, is it the duty of us being good Samaritans to work for our governments to be more active in this situation? Yes, it is, I think. Um, <laughs> these, these parables are intended to shock us and to make us feel um, that we've got to rethink everything. And that's the strategy of Jesus' parables. And so we immediately think, I couldn't be like that, Samaritan. I'm unable to do that. I couldn't afford it. And that's how we're supposed to feel. And we're supposed to feel so disconcerted by this. Because at one level, the Samaritan does what any decent neighbor would do. He helps somebody. At another level, he helps him to a degree that is, is totally uh, beyond common sense. So I, there's, I think there's no way to answer that problem except for us to acknowledge it and to allow the parable to continue to trouble us and to continue to, to um, disconcert us because that's what it's supposed to do. But rather than being left completely paralyzed by those feelings, we, we have to find ways that we respond, and that's always going to be, I think, diverse in terms of our individual response and in terms of the structural response. It is the case, I think, that um, some of the most pressing social needs that we have can only really be changed by government policy. For example, in New Zealand at the moment, there's a good deal of public concern about the levels of child poverty. They're, you know, in a, in a wealthy very wealthy, um, blessed country, they are scandalously high. One in five children in New Zealand live in poverty. 
Now, you and I could give away all our possessions and maybe help a child, but it's not going to change the statistics overall. That requires government action. This is a good thing for us Anabaptists to remember, actually, <laughs> that there are things that the government can do that the church can't do and that individuals can't do. And so I think these are never alternatives. It's always got to do both. And we have to, we have to practice as Christian communities who, who, who strive to follow Jesus. We have to practice um, good Samaritanism ourselves. But we also have to, I think, agitate for the power of the state to be involved in a good Samaritan direction. by this story because it focuses so much on the victim. And I think uh, oftentimes we start just as practitioners talk about victim offender. And that kind of gets things out of order because until the victim is restored, then you begin to look at that, that second part. And so I, I was just really struck by the, the, the powerful way in which the victim it was very much center state. Mm -hmm. And yet, for government and for the criminal justice system, it's really the offender who is center state. And, and that, that really gets us off on the right track, wrong track, I think, yep. in the way how we respond. Yep. Yes, I was um, working on the parables. There were some commentators who suggested that the victim was completely irrelevant to the story. You just needed the victim to get the, get the show on the road. <laughs> but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the whole story is about the victim. Only the victim is present in every scene of the parable. Um, the, the story is told from the perspective of the victim. Jesus asks the victim's question, you know, to whom am I going to be a neighbor? Um, so I, th I think the victim, or perhaps better, I, I, I even caught myself when I was reading the lecture, almost wanting to say victimization more than victim. Because the problem today is that the language of victims and offenders has become so highly politicized. And so, People now champion the cause of victims in the abstract as a way of actually um, trying to be harsher on, on offenders. And uh, you know, the sort of victims' rights movement, especially in the US but elsewhere, has been used to justify um, longer prison sentences and the like. And it, it becomes the word victim itself has become a political sort of um, banner. But if we thought of victimization, well, I prefer to think of the centrality that restorative justice has on the harm that is suffered. The story of justice is, to me, not victim-centered, it's harm-centered. And the harm has been experienced primarily by the innocent victim, but it's also been experienced by the offender. Um, so if we thought of offenders as victims acting out the victimization through their offending, then it helps us from sort of playing one up against the other. But certainly, the, I think the whole story is about victims' needs. And just a final comment. One other thing that struck me was that they never did call the police or the, the justice system wasn't involved. Yeah. And that is, ironically, it's very true of most victims of crime. Yeah. They, it's not reported to police. Yeah. And so this this That's interesting, yeah. 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 I mean, I suppose the first century was the word of police to call in quite that sense, but yes, it, it takes place quite apart from, I mean, it, it's sort of set in lawless country between two cities. The coercive power of, of, of government, I suppose, was concentrated in the urban areas where, you know, where the soldiers were based, this takes place in a sort of space between urban areas. So there's a kind of lawlessness about the whole context. And I suppose I hadn't thought of this until you mentioned it, Mark, but it could be seen as a further kind of invitation to see these things as extra legal rather than being resolved through legal interventions. Yeah. <clears throat> Last night, you uh, made references to sort of the multi-faith aspect of the, the role of the Samaritan. And um, the question Jesus is, uh, is answering is, what do I do to obtain eternal life? And Jesus' answer is, is focused really ethically on uh, that, 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 that response to the question. So um, when we think about interfaith dialogue, then, do ethics trump? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
speaking to a, a Mennonite, mainly Mennonite audience, of course, this is perhaps not as problematic as it would be if I was speaking to a mainly evangelical or Lutheran audience, <laughs> who immediately wanted to say, what about faith? And aren't we saved by faith, not by deeds? And um, in a sense, I suppose, that applies at the interfaith dimension as well, as, as you're, you're raising. And that would lead us into a, a, a larger, and out of my expertise, but into a larger theological discussion about the relationship between faith and works and how they how they interact in the experience of salvation. To say that ethics is essential to embracing the, the way of, of, of salvation is not to say that ethics by itself does the whole job. It's to say that ethics is part of the human response that's necessary in order to benefit from the work of salvation, which is ultimately a work of grace. Um, so does ethics trump, does ethics trump what? Does ethics trump Theology, does ethics trump belief? Um, again, I'm a coward, aren't I? I just want to say, why do we choose between these things? Why don't we say that they're part of the whole? You love God with all your mind and heart and strength. And so it's a whole lot. You've got to get the whole lot together rather than choosing false alternatives. But certainly, I can't read the gospel tradition. And for that matter, I can't even read the Apostle Paul without being struck by how important the ethical response call to righteousness is as part of embracing the work of salvation. We're not saved by our work, but we're not saved without our works either. You told the powerful story of the Good Samaritan. My question for you is, um, oftentimes we don't see the victim in front of us. But in our daily life, we see victims in Syria being brutally harmed, hurt, murdered, killed, tortured, every single thing that you've, you've talked about in terms of this, this story. My question for you is, as a Canadian, how, do, how am I a good Samaritan? Wow, okay. <laughs> I, I was mentioning at a, a seminar at AMBS a few days ago, and I mentioned it in the book. Um, there was a very famous essay written by Peter Singer, the Australian philosopher who teaches at one of the big universities in the US country, which one it is now, Yale or something like that. He wrote an essay in 1971, which essentially asked the question, um, if I am morally obligated to save my neighbor's child if, if he or she falls into the swimming pool, that's a moral duty on me. Am I not also morally obligated to help the children of people in far distant lands that I do not see? And the question, the philosophical and moral question comes down to what role does distance play in working out my moral obligations? Um, if I will help the, 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 the child I see before me, why would I not help the starving child in faraway lands? If I would help a victim on the road to Waterloo, why will I not help the victim in the road to Baghdad? Uh, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a very troubling question to live with. And Singer, uh, 30 years later, wrote a, a piece which essentially, <coughs> essentially confirmed the earlier judgment that from a moral point of view, from a philosophical point of view, distance is irrelevant. I am equally obligated to the victims in Syria as I am to the victims in the war. But the question then arises, well, how do I cope with that? Um, and the only, I mean, I can't remember all the details of the discussion I, I have on that issue in the book, but one thing I can remember is that if I were to believe that I was, I had an unlimited obligation to help every victim in the world, I would soon destroy myself as a moral agent and be of no use to anyone. So that I have to recognize my own finitude in choosing the, the, the areas that I, I, I give to or, or work with. And this, again, is where I think the community becomes such an important resource. If we read the story of the Good Samaritan as about communities of response, and not just about individuals, so that can be a cop-out as well, but, um, and realize that, you know, that I might not be able to help the, the Syrians, but other people can, or I can help those who can. Again, it's just part of the discomfort of living with these difficult moral choices and allowing this sort of perspective to continue to bother us. The idea of seeing even is, is troubling, isn't it? He saw the victim. Um, I don't want to see the victims overseas. 
don't want to know about it. And so it's, I don't have any answers except to say that it's, it's something we have to think about and, and work with. Samaritan might do good <clears throat> and do good in a way that might even have put themselves to shame in mm -hmm. some sense. As someone who's reflected deeply on the, the context of this story and on its contemporary applicability, who do you think, uh, if the story of the parable were to be told for the first time today, the Samaritan might, might be? <laughs> <laughs> I well, um, I guess it would depend on your context. <laughs> And the problem is that we would find it very difficult to hear the story for the first time now, because we know that there'll be a trick. <laughs> um, you know, I could imagine, for example, in apartheid South Africa, that the Good Samaritan might be an Afrikaner person. I can imagine in many congregations uh, in many churches around the world, the Good Samaritan might be an act of homosexual. Mm -hmm. um, I can imagine in many of our societies today, the Samaritan might be a pedophile who's just been released from prison. Mm -hmm. People that we instinctively recoil from, as, as, as the, the Jews and the Samaritans would have instinctively recoiled from one another, and perhaps as good, liberal, well-educated, Western people, we probably tell ourselves that we don't recoil from anybody, but we do. <laughs> so we need to find out the people that we find it difficult to, and, and always have that disgust reaction to. You know, disgust is a very powerful emotion. And so the Samaritan was somebody that would have disgusted the hearers and vice versa. So who, who are the people that disgust us? I'm wondering whether I can make a confession at this point. <laughs> um, you talked yesterday, and again today briefly, about labeling. And what came to mind is the way in which in the contemporary gun debate in the States particularly, the language of good guys and bad guys is uh, very prevalent. Uh, and then I became aware of how unqualified, my sense, is that the leadership and the membership of the NRA are clearly bad guys. So that's a confession. And I'm wondering, I was trying to repopulate your parable by having the Samaritan being a member of the NRA. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I mean, that's... I know, gosh, it is hard to be a Christian. <laughs> get away with anything. Any, any moral judgment that you feel is justified, you get caught on. I was struck as well by the good guys and the bad guys language, and it's used a lot by the American military. Yes. Um, and it's kind of colloquial, but it's also also concerning. And who was it that said, there was a chairman of the NRA, wasn't it, who said the answer to bad guys in school is that good guys with guns. And the rest of the world is a deep castle. But yes, we, then we just have to reverse it and realize that we, we do the same the other way. And I guess one of the things that keeps us from, from well, keeps me from reaching out to those who might profoundly disagree with them and, and, and dislike is partly my own reaction, but partly how other people might think about me if I associate with them. You know, the shame of association and associate with a you know, good left wing liberal person associated with the NRA. <laughs> um. <laughs> um, before I thank you, Chris, I want to make two comments. One is Hannah, one of our students here, has reminded me that this, partially in response to Lowell's comment, that this Friday night here there is going to be a fundraising event. Uh, the, the next Friday night, there's going to be a fundraising event here for those involved in trying to help in Syria. And so um, that, again, is one example of, of some kind of thing that can be done. If you want to know more about it, please speak to, to Hannah afterwards. 
a reminder again that there are our books here at the back. Uh, Chris's books, actually, so sort of one of uh, Tom's recent book, and some other ones that uh, have been supplied for us. So we welcome you to pick those up uh, and pay for them uh, <laughs> before you before you leave. <laughs> Chris, I. I, I, I thank you on behalf of all of these people and on behalf of people who are, who are watching this and who will watch it, who will read the article. Um, you've been an exemplary guest in the sense that you've uh, brought us so much more than we could have even known when we invited you. And that's been a, a great gift of your hospitality to us. And we're very, very thankful. Um, I, I want to say something to you in front of these windows which we have in our chapel. Because as you spoke yesterday and as you spoke today, uh, I was so struck also by the way in which you opened this to us. Um, piece by piece, I would call it building block by building block by building block. And as you proceeded, we realized that uh, you were building a cathedral. And the cathedral has wonderful light, it has windows. but. It wasn't just those, all those little pieces which you so carefully put in place for us, but it was this quite remarkable edifice based on you know, what Jesus said and that you, you opened up to us. So I thank you for what you've done for us and for that building and for the glory of the light as well. So thank you very much. And thank you all very much. I remind you again, in the, in the program, there are uh, indications of future programs that we'll be having here, and um, please join us again. Good night.